I'm going to talk about verifying distributed systems with a tool called Ivy. And to give a sense of the problem that Ivy is trying to solve, I'd like to start with a few quotations uh, from a distinguished group of security researchers in a paper from SOSP 17, where they're doing formal verification of the implementation of a secure enclave, something like Intel SGX. Uh, and they're using a very powerful automated prover called Microsoft Z3, along with uh, other tools like Daphne and so forth. Uh, and to give you an idea of their experience with that, here are a few quotations. The most frustrating recurring problem was proof instability. Timeouts are challenging to debug because the solver generally fails to provide useful feedback. Even once fixed, the proof may easily time out again due to minor perturbations. Worse, minor changes can trigger timeouts in seemingly unrelated proofs. So what I take away from these quotes is that even though Z3 is a very powerful automated prover, somehow that deduction power is not translating into verification productivity in the way that we would like. They're trying to do a big proof here and having a lot of trouble. So my take on that then is that really if we want to use automated proof in the context of larger manual proofs, we need it to have certain properties. And the first of these is predictability. So we can reduce proofs to automated lemmas because we have some idea, we can somehow reasonably predict how the solver is going to perform on those lemmas. Moreover, we need some kind of stability or continuity. That is, we can't have small irrelevant changes in the proof goal leading to a great impact in the solver performance. We don't want to have butterfly effect. And third, we need to have transparency, and this is very important. When things don't work, when you don't get a proof of a lemma, you need to have some actionable feedback to tell you what to do next to solve the problem. So I'm going to refer to these three properties as PST, for predictability, stability, and transparency. Now, Ivy is designed as a deductive verification tool to try to make maximal use of the power of the Z3 theorem prover in concert with a human user. And it's designed basically on the following hypotheses. First, that these PST properties, predictability, stability, transparency, will lead to greater productivity of the human engineer in doing a large proof. Second, that the way to get a tool like Z3 to have these properties is to use it in a domain in which it is a decision procedure. Okay, and we'll talk more about that later. And thirdly, that there are reasonable tools and strategies that we can use to reduce our proof goals to lemmas that are in that decidable realm. And this is where Ivy comes in. Ivy is supposed to give you those tools and strategies to do that reduction. So let's just start out with a super simple example that shows some of these, some of these issues in action. So I'm going to just do a sort of textbook style proof of a procedure that takes in an array as an argument and it returns a reversed copy of that array. And you can see that in the middle of this procedure I've got a loop. It loops over the indices of the array and it sets b of length minus index minus 1 equal to a. That is, it's just reversing the order of the array. So, if, of course, if I want to prove this correct, I first have to write a specification. And that's going to look fairly typical. I'll say the length of the output has to be equal to the length of the input. And for all indices up to the length, you know, b of length, of length minus j minus i is equal to a of j. That is, the arrays are reversed. And to prove this deductively, I'll also need an inductive invariant that's going to look very similar. So for example, it's going to say for all indices up to, for all positions in the array up to the index variable that this reverse condition holds. Now, to do this proof with Z3 then, what I would do is I would generate verification conditions in a perfectly standard way. For example, I have to show that the invariant implies the weakest precondition of the invariant relative to the loop body and so forth. And this gives me a collection of first order formulas that I have to show are valid. And in fact, if I try that with Z3, it can easily solve that problem. Okay, but suppose that I were to make a mistake. Let's say, for example, that here, instead of hitting the one key, I hit the two key, and I got the wrong specification. Well, what do you suppose happened when I tried to put these verification conditions into Z3? Well, 
The first time I tried it, Z3 just didn't come back. Right? It just went as long as I could wait. And when I tried it a couple of months later, maybe with different parameters for the solver, it came back pretty quickly, but it said unknown. It gave me neither a proof nor a counterexample for this. And I think you can guess why this is. It's because this verification condition is living in an undecidable logic. We have quantifiers, we have integers, we have arrays. And that's enough to be undecidable. And when we're in an undecidable logic, we might get an answer, but we get answers unpredictably, unstably, and when things go wrong, the failure is opaque. We don't know what went wrong. And I'll talk more later about why that is. OK, so on the other hand, if I put this program into IV, it wouldn't even run Z3. Instead, it would give me this error message. It says, the verification condition is not in the fragment FAU. Well, FAU is a fragment of the logic for which Z3 is a decision procedure. And I'll talk about that later. Then it says, an interpreted symbol is applied to a universally quantified variable. It's giving me a reason for not being in the fragment. And in particular, it's pointing to an expression in my code that's length minus j. So the interpreted symbol is subtraction, and j is the universally quantified variable. And it's saying this is a problem for decidability. You need to fix this. OK, so now I have some actionable feedback. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to apply a general strategy that I'm going to talk about in a minute. To fix the problem, I'm going to take that arithmetic operator, and I'm going to hide it inside a relational abstraction. In other words, I'm going to use information hiding to make this problem decidable, to break it up into decidable pieces. So let's see what that hiding would look like. What I'm going to do is I will create a module. I'll call it rev of t, where t is the index type of the array. And it exports two things, a relation, r of u x t. And that's going to represent the fact that x and y are reversed positions in an array of length u. Okay. So that's just an abstract mathematical relation. And the other thing the module exports is a procedure that I'll call app for apply that actually, given an x, will compute the y. It will find me the reversed position in that array. Okay. So that's something I can execute in my code. Right, then I will write a specification of this thing that's just purely in first-order logic. It doesn't involve any arithmetic, which is my problem. So the specification is going to start with a bunch of properties of that abstract relation that I would need to prove array reversal. For example, it's a partial function from x to y. I don't need to know it's a total function. Partial is good enough. It's order reversing, which means that if x is less than y, and I reverse them both, then the reverse of y will now be less than the reverse of x. Right, so that's a natural property of reversal. And also, I need to show that uh, if x maps to x1, then in fact, x1 is in the correct range. And those are all the properties that I need, that I'm going to need to do my proof about this reversal relation. Okay, and then for my procedure, apply, I'm just going to specify that it computes the right thing according to this abstract relation r. That is, if I return a value y, then r u x y is going to hold as a post condition. And that's all that I'm going to export. And that's all that my program will rely on. And then I'll give an implementation. And the implementation will use the actual arithmetic. So I can say, for example, I can give a definition of this reversal relation. It just says it's equivalent to saying y is equal to u minus x minus 1. And I can give an implementation of the applied that just says use subtraction. And so the nice thing about this is this module totally hides the arithmetic, but when I want to verify this with Z3, all of my verification conditions are going to be quantifier-free. This is basically because all the quantifiers are actually in, in the properties, and those get negated and scolomized. So this is easy for Z3 to verify in a reliable way, and IV won't complain that it's outside my decidable fragment. So that's half the problem. And then the other half is to actually use that abstraction. So what I'll do is, when I computed the reverse index of the array to set b of length minus, you know, index minus 1 equal to a of index, I'm now going to delegate that computation to that abstract module. So now I don't see the subtraction in my program anymore. And similarly, when I write the specification, I'm going to now use that abstract relation rev.r that describes reversal to say each uh, element of b is equal to the corresponding element of a. And similarly, I'll, I'll do the same thing in the inductive invariant. 
And now I have verification conditions that are going to live just in uh, first order logic with you know, functions and equality. And now Ivy will say, yes, that's okay. That's in my decidable fragment. I can check that reliably. So my problem was that I had mixed quantifiers with interpreted arithmetic, now so it was making it hard. And my solution was to separate the quantifier reasoning and the arithmetic reasoning into two different modules. In other words, to do information hiding, to figure out the right abstraction that I needed, which was this collection of properties of this abstract relation R. Okay, so that's a general tactic that we're going to see used again and again. So, of course, we still need to know what's really decidable in Z3. You know, what actually can it handle in a reliable way? Well, the main problem with decidability is quantifiers, and Z3 handles quantifiers in two different ways. First, it uses triggers, which are just patterns that it uses to find ground terms to plug in for the universal quantifiers, to instantiate them. Or, alternatively, it uses something called model-based quantifier instantiation, which is a kind of CGAR, that uses counter models to select new instances. So whenever we get a counter model, we try to find a ground instance of a, of a quantified formula that will rule out the counter example. But either way, we can go to infinity. Right, so in other words, both these methods are unstable and opaque. They're based on heuristics. If I get lucky with the right counter model or the right trigger, I win and I get a proof. If I get unlucky, it runs forever. Okay, so this is really bad. On the other hand, there are fragments of Z3's logic for which it is actually designed to be a decision procedure, and it will guarantee not to diverge just because of a bad heuristic choice. So it's going to be much more stable. And the first and simplest fragment is what are called stratified formulas. So if I have first-order formulas over some sorts, I'll say the formula is stratified if the graph induced on those sorts by the function symbols is acyclic. Okay, and when I do that, if I have quantifier alternations, I also have to think about the skolem functions, because Z3 is going to reason in terms of the skolem normal form of these formulas. And I'll just give a couple of, of examples of that. So let's say I want to decide whether this formula is satisfiable. For all x, there exists a y such that f of x equals y. Should be satisfiable. Well, when I scolemize it, that existential variable y gets translated to a function of x, because it's for all x there exists a y. So that turns into f of x equals g of x. Right? And this is going to be stratified, because if I think about the sorts, if f is a function from sort s to sort t, then g is also a function from sort s to sort t. So both those function arrows go in the same direction, and this is a stratified formula. On the other hand, if I turn it around and say for all x there exists a y such that f of y equals x, which is sort of like saying f has an inverse, right, well, when I scolemize it, I get f of g of x equals x, and now g and f are going in the opposite direction. Okay? That is, if g is a function from sort s to sort t, f has got to be a function from sort t back to sort s, so I have a cycle in the function graph, and if I have even one universally quantified variable in that cycle, I'm outside the decidable fragment. Okay, and Ivy is going to complain about that. Okay, so stratification is going to be an important issue in some examples that we'll look at. But Z3 actually allows you to go a little further than that. We could talk about something called the finite effectively uninterpreted fragment that lets us do a little bit of interpreted reasoning. Okay, so let's say we have some interpreted function symbols like plus or less than. As long as they have no variables under them that are universally quantified, that's going to be okay. That's still in the decidable fragment. So you remember before, Ivy was complaining because I had a universally quantified variable j under an interpreted subtraction operator. And so I wasn't in this fragment. Okay. Or I can go still a little further. Actually, I think this here is a connection to Zohar already. I can talk about the finite, almost an uninterpreted fragment, and that gives me some limited use of variables under inequalities in arithmetic. So I can say, for example, x is less than y plus 1. And if you're fam familiar with the decidable array property fragment, well, this subsumes that fragment. So this gives us a fairly rich language that we can target for automation, for proving lemmas. And Ivy can check that if we have our verif that whether our verification conditions 
are in fact in one of these decidable fragments, and it can provide us actionable diagnostics when they aren't. So this is giving us transparency. Right? We know what to do when something went wrong. Okay, so now let's talk about um, now let's talk about uh, uh, distributed protocols. And I'm going to use a very toy example, but we'll see later that the same techniques that we use here can be used for real protocols. So the toy example is a leader election protocol. We have n processes where n is arbitrary that are trying to choose a leader. And the way it works is if someone wants to become a leader, they can broadcast a request message, which goes into the network. It might be duplicated, it might be dropped. We could have multiple requests to be leader. And if you receive a request, you can choose to vote for the sender of that request by broadcasting a vote message, but you can only vote once. So what we want to prove about this protocol then, well, so when you receive a majority of votes, you become leader. And we want to prove that you have at most one leader. Right, well, let's think about where the decidability issues might be here. We can start thinking about that before we even look at the code. Right, so we know if we, prove, if we want to prove this protocol, we're going to have to have an inductive invariant. And that invariant is going to have to have a quantifier over process IDs, because we have an arbitrary number of process IDs. Okay, so there we have quantifiers. And we know the protocol state's going to contain certain kinds of information. It's going to use a certain vocabulary. For example, I have to keep track of all the messages that have been sent. So I'll have a predicate called sent that remembers the set of messages that have been sent. Arbitrary. It's uh, it's just broadcast. So it could be disconnected. Uh, yes, it's not live. Don't worry. Yeah, it's only it's safe, but it's not live. It's a it's a toy. Fine. We'll get to we'll get. I'm still worried. But <laughs> we'll get to liveness later in the in the in, life, in the lecture. So, and we have a predicate voted that remembers for each process whether it voted or not, because you're only allowed to vote once. And we'll have some kind of a map that I'll call votes that maps a process ID to the set of processes that have voted for it, okay? because we need to know when a given process has a majority. So we know the state's going to look something like this in its signature. And we know that we're going to see some code somewhere that looks like this. Somewhere it's going to say, if the, number of, if the size of the set of votes of P is greater than half, then P becomes the leader and sends out a leader message. That's got to exist somewhere. So now we can see already that we're in trouble, because what do we have? We have cardinality of sets, we have arithmetic, we have uninterpreted functions like votes, we have quantifiers, undecidable. Right? We're not in the decidable fragment. So we need to figure out how to separate things out into decidable pieces. Okay, and our first, the first piece of our approach will be to try to hide that cardinality reasoning in an abstract data type, just like we did with the array reversal example. So here's what the signature of that abstract data type might look like. We're going to have a data type set of process ID, where a process ID is a type. In its signature, it will have a function that, uh, at, that tells us whether a process ID is in a given set, or a predicate, if you will. It will have a predicate majority that tells us whether the set is a majority. It will have a couple of procedures for building sets, like return the empty set, or add one element to a set. So those are the things we're going to export. And here's what the specification looks like. Okay, we're going to have some properties of our procedures. For example, as a post condition, empty has to ensure it returns a set with no members. And add can also be specified in first order logic, saying we add one element. And most importantly, we're going to say something about that majority predicate, which is that we need the property that for any two majorities, S and T, there exists a process ID that's a member of both majorities. That's the property of a majority that we're going to need to prove that we have only one leader. Right, so this is going to be an abstraction that's just a set of properties that we'll prove about this signature. And we can go ahead and implement that in any way that we want. So you'll notice that all of these properties that we're going to use are just plain old first order logic with equality. There's no cardinality. There's no arithmetic. Okay, so we've hidden all of that inside the implementation of the module. And I don't have time to show you that implementation, but using very standard techniques, uh, we, can, we can implement it in a way that our verification conditions will fall into this FAU fragment that I talked about, the one that allows you to use a little bit of arithmetic. 
Okay, so we can verify all of this in a decidable way. We then get this set of properties which we can use to verify our protocol. Okay, but we still have a problem. And that is we're going we're to have a problem of non-stratification. That is, we'll have cycles in the function graph. You remember I said that in the state we have this function votes that maps process IDs to the set of voters for that process ID. Well, if you look at this majority property, remember I said the majority property says any two majorities intersect. Well, that's a for all exists that goes from sets to process IDs. It goes back the other direction. Right, so we have a function cycle here now from process IDs to sets back to process IDs if we use both of these things in the VC. And somehow we're going to have to separate those. Okay, well, the solution again is going to be to use some abstraction to hide something. In this case, what we'll hide is that majority predicate. So we'll use a very general sort of strategy. We'll create an abstract model of the protocol that doesn't use that function votes. It's going to be a relational model. Okay, it's not going to be something executable. It'll be purely abstract. But because we're encoding things differently in that model, we'll be able to reason with this majority predicate in a decidable way. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so here's basically this abstraction of the protocol is just a collection of ghost procedures or actions that will update an abstract state. Okay, and the state's going to be modeled just with relations, not with functions, to avoid the stratification problem. So here's one procedure, here's one of those ghost procedures. It says, call me when process V is voting for process N. And it has a precondition that says, N, uh, that V can never have voted for anyone else before. And assuming that precondition holds, then we set voted V N to be true. And um, I think you saw this in Sharon's talk, this is an example of a relational update in the IV language. Okay, so note that voted is a relation between processes, it's not a function. Okay, so the other procedure in our abstract model of the protocol is called make leader. And make leader is called whenever process n thinks it's becoming the leader. And it has to give a set s as a witness for that. That's a majority that voted for it. So we have a precondition that says s is a majority. And we have a precondition that says everyone in that set voted for process n. And if those are satisfied, then we set is leader of n to true. We make it the leader in the abstract. And we also remember that set s as a witness. We store it in a state variable as a witness that this is the majority that voted for n. Now, we can verify this by giving a very simple inductive invariant that basically says, first of all, there's only ever one leader. Second, voted is a partial function, which means nobody votes twice. Okay. And third, that if there's a leader, then that leader has a correct quorum. And this is an inductive invariant for this pair of actions. Right? And I can prove it purely in first order logic with equality. Right? There's no arithmetic here, right? and there's no function cycle. Right? So it's in stratified first order logic. Okay, so I made everything stratified in my abstract model. Now I'm going to use that essentially as a lemma to prove the correctness of my implementation. Please. I'm sorry? Yeah, so the invariant is an invariant of these two actions. Both of these actions preserve the invariant. So no matter how you call these actions, as long as you satisfy the precondition, that invariant will continue to hold. And so in particular, this piece of the invariant, the fact that there's one leader, I can now use as a lemma. Okay, and I'll show you how, that, how that's done. So here's what happens. My implementation is going to be real executable code that runs on the real network, say using UDP. It's going to be decorated, though, with ghost calls into that abstract model. And those ghost car calls aren't going to execute in reality. They're going, to be, they're going to be sliced out in the real executable code, but they'll help with the proof. And the reason is that I can use that invariant that I proved about the abstract model to help me prove correctness of my implementation. So here's an example of a piece of code from the implementation. It's the thing that's handling incoming request messages. So it says process P is receiving a, a request from process N. So if I'm P and I haven't voted, 
then I will remember that I voted. I'll set my voted bit to true. And I will send out a vote message for n. I'll do the broadcast into the network. But finally, I will call this ghost action that says, I'm voting now. Right? Okay, that's going to update the abstract state. And it's going to require me to satisfy the precondition that I haven't voted already. That was the precondition of, of abs.vote. Okay. So when I do this, I can now import that inductive invariant from the abstract model into my procedure here so that instead of using the majority, the majority property that said every two, uh, every two majorities have an element in common, I now just use that one leader invariant. Right? And now, again, I'm stratified. I have no function cycles. <coughs> and that means I can ask Z3 to reliably prove my inductive invariant. And my inductive invariant in this case is actually going to be relation between the state of this real implementation and the state of that ghost abstract model. So that was allow. Uh, yeah, so you're saying, what if the protocol were open and others could join? <laughs> you had the ad members. Right, so, so then you'd have, to have, you'd have to have blockchain or something if you wanted that. This yeah, is but, the but you, you had the ad member data, right? Yeah, so you there's a finite... Member, so you can add arbitrary many members? Right, so, so what you're not seeing here is that sort of process IDs is finite. Oh, right? So it's of arbitrary size, but it's fixed and finite. So, so therefore, you can have a majority. If it, was, if it wasn't finite, you couldn't have a majority. OK, good question. Um, so now you might say, well, you know, that's a lot of complication. I had to break things into three separate modules just to do reasoning about this really simple, stupid protocol. But the thing is, exactly that same decomposition of the problem works for more interesting things. For example, we did variants of the Paxos consensus protocol or the Raft consensus protocol. And these are distributed protocols that are they're widely used in cloud services to implement things like replicated state machines. And basically what you have is a collection of distributed processes that can fail and that have to agree on some sequence of actions. And they usually have a leader election phase that's a little bit similar to this toy example. Kay, so the thing is we can use the same strategy that we just used for the toy protocol for these real protocols. So what we're going to do is we use the same abstract data type for sets with majority in order to eliminate the cardinality reasoning or to hide it. We'll use an abstract protocol model that has a purely relational state. Okay, there are no functions in the state, just relations so that we avoid function cycles. We'll prove a consistency property of that abstract model and just like we did with the toy model, we'll then use that consistency uh, property as a lemma to prove correctness of our, to prove consistency of our actual executable code. So then we'll have uh, a consensus protocol that we can actually run and that's verified. So, of course, I can't show you that proof, but I wanted to show you just a piece of it, which is the inductive invariant for a particular flavor of Paxos that relates the concrete implementation with that abstract relational model. And of course, I don't want you to read this. All I want you to do is to see that it's a little bit complicated. Right? And this is not the kind of thing that you could just come up with and write down and have it be correct. The only way a human being could come up with this is iteratively, right? where I go through the process, just like Sharon is describing, of getting counterexamples to induction and fixing it and fixing it, weakening it, strengthening it, until it's eventually right. And in a day or two, you could get this inductive invariant. But you could only do it if your verification condition checker was predictable and stable and transparent. If the thing was failing in a random way due to, due to you know, butterfly effect, not giving, an not giving an answer, not giving a counterexample, then this process would get much harder and your productivity would be much less. Right? So I just want to make the point that in order to develop an object like this, we really need those properties of the decision procedure. And that's why we go through this process of trying to make the verification conditions decidable. So that then has an effect on our overall productivity and verification. So in these examples, like in Paxos and Raft, we found that Z3 never failed to produce 
a proof or a counterexample. We didn't have those problems that I talked about in the quotes at the beginning where you know, there was, uh, we, didn't, we randomly didn't get an answer or we didn't get any actionable feedback. Okay, so all of that just doesn't happen here. Moreover, what we found was that requiring decidability doesn't actually add to the overall complexity of the proof that the human is generating. Right? If, if anything, those proofs are actually a little bit simpler. Right? So that means that our overall proof productivity compared to the kind of methodology that I was talking about at the beginning is greatly, is greatly increased. And if you'd like to see more details of that, there's a paper in the proceedings and also there's a paper in um, PLDI 2018 that describes this work on the, uh, on the consensus protocols. So, um, all right, so what you've seen so far is this idea of using information hiding to get decidability. And now Oded's gonna take us a little bit further and we're going to look at how you would encode things, how you solve problems like you know, dealing with um, reachability in graphs and how you solve, uh, how you would handle liveness properties for infinite state systems. And we'll see once again that with the right encoding, we can solve these problems in a decidable fragment. Okay, so as Ken mentioned, uh, I, I will show you an example that illustrates two other techniques uh, for encoding things for decidability. And really what maybe you will notice about this example in comparison with the previous example is that uh, before the decomposition was into two parts that are both checked mechanically by IV and just the decomposition led to decidability with modularity. And here we'll use a slightly different decomposition where we, we, we have some general idea that we prove it on paper and then we, it allows us to decompose the proof and have what's checked automatically, have that being decidable. And the piece that we prove on paper is very generic, we reuse it for many things and it lets the automation be, be decidable. So we're going to prove a, a very simple example of a fair queue implemented by a linked list. So the idea is that we have a, a linked list and we represent it with these next pointers that are represented by the n binary relation. We have the head of the list and the tail of the list. And we have two operations. We can enqueue a new element by prepending it at the head of the list. So we have some element outside the queue and we change the head of the list and add a pointer here to enqueue an element into the queue. And we dequeue elements by removing from the tail of the list, just removing the tail, and now this element becomes the tail. And uh, we're, we're going to prove, a, a, we're going to prove a, a liveness property of this, uh, of this queue. And I before I show you the formula, intuitively the liveness property that I want to, to say is that every element that enters the queue eventually leaves the queue, is eventually gets dequeued. And this, of course, depends on a fairness assumption that we infinitely often dequeue elements from this side of the, of the queue. And you see here a, a formalization of this. So this is maybe a, another point where we see echoes of, uh, of Zohar Mana's work. You see that this logic that it's written here, it's a combination of first order logic and, uh, and also with the temporal operators. And I learned about this logic from papers by Zohar Mana and his students. Um, so you see that our liveness property is that for every element, it's infinitely often outside of the queue. Infinitely often, it does not have a successor, a, a next pointer. And our fairness assumption is that uh, we infinitely often dequeue elements from the, uh, from, from the queue. And really, to show that this holds, we, we want to show that for an arbitrary element C, there cannot be an infinite trace of this system such that it both infinitely often dequeues and that eventually C is in the queue and never goes out of the queue. C eventually becomes stuck in the queue. We want to rule out such an infinite trace. And uh, the classical way to do this is to provide a ranking function. And uh, a natural ranking function here would be to, to look at the, all the elements that are reachable from C. So the cardinality of the set of all x's, such that n star holds between c and x, 
where n star is the reflexive transitive closure of, uh, of n, of the, of the list pointer. And this is maybe very intuitive and straightforward, but if we think about it from the perspective of decidability, it's going to be very problematic. And the reason is that this, this simple ranking function contains both transitive closure, which is a concept that is not expressible in first-order logic. We don't have a complete proof system for it, and it's hard, it's very, uh, it's, it's not going to be uh, decidable to check. And the second one is set cardinalities, and of course we're going to also need some quantifiers for, for proving this system, and this combination will lead again to undecidability for checking the verification conditions. Mm -hmm. So what I'll show you in the rest of the talk is how we uh, encode the problem a bit differently and, do prove and we manage to prove this example in a, in a de in a with decidable uh, fragments. And we'll see two tricks that we use, or two techniques that we use. One to handle uh, transitive closure, and one to, to prove liveness properties, but not with, uh, not with ranking functions. And the techniques for transitive closure originate from the works of, uh, of Shachar Itzhaki, and the liveness proofs were recently developed. So the, the trick for uh, encoding transitive closure is the following observation. We have, say we have a, a linked list, there are two uh, useful re relations we can define on, on this uh, graph. There, is, there are the edges, the next pointers, and the transitive closure, n star. And we have two alternative representations for this graph. One is to have n as a primitive relation, and then this is really the structure, and n star is defined from n by the reflexive transitive closure, and we know that this is not definable in first order logic. The other alternative, is to maintain n star as the primitive relation and then define n by the transitive reduction of n star. And in the case of linked lists, this is unique because the out degree of this graph is 1, so the transitive reduction uniquely defines n from n star. And uh, another benefit of this is that then we can express the, the next edges, we can express the edges from n star in first order logic, just using one universal quantifier here. So this is like a classical uh, exercise in first order logic, how to express the successor relation out of the order relation. So if you think of the natural numbers. And really there it, it, it matters a lot which encoding you choose, and we, we are going to choose this encoding. And the reason it matters so much is that going from here to here, it's not expressible in first order logic. To get this structure from this structure, you have to have a transitive closure operator. And to go from this structure to this structure, you can express it in first order logic, and in fact, you can even remain in the decidable fragment. Uh, this is an even, even simpler decidable fragment than the stratified sort. It just uh, exists for all formulas, like we saw in the morning. So this was the first trick for transitive closure, and, but really this, uh, th this proof, we, we convince ourselves on paper, and we, don't, uh, and we just reuse it. And the second trick I want to show you is how we, prove, how we can prove uh, uh, liveness, uh, liveness properties. And the overall idea would be to use a, a lasso-based argument. So the, this kind of argument uh, originated in finite state, in the world of finite state and parameterized system. And in a, in a finite uh, state system, you can say that you can prove that there is no infinite trace by just excluding a kind of lasso counterexample because in a finite state world, I any infinite trace has to have some state that it visits infinitely often, or actually vi it's enough to say that it has to visit it twice, so we will have to have some lasso counterexample. And if we can rule out those, then we prove that there is no, uh, no infinite counterexample. So if there is no lasso, we have liveness, and it's equivalent. We, lose n we don't lose any precision in the finite state case. If we try to apply this argument for infinite state, of course it's not sound because we could have an infinite trace that never repeats a state, so it wouldn't be sound to use this argument. What we can do to recover soundness is we can apply a finite abstraction and then try to, sh to show that there is no abstract lasso, that there are no two states in the trace that have the same abstract value. But of course we could get spurious counterexamples 
Like here you see that maybe this state is termin may maybe this system is terminating, it has no infinite traces, but these two states just happen to fall into to be abstracted to the same <coughs> abstract element. So here we, we're still sound. If we prove that there is no lasso, we proved liveness, but we we lost a lot of precision. And for most interesting systems, this no finite abstraction would work. And the idea that we use is is a is an improvement uh, of, of, of this idea by using a dynamic finite abstraction. So the, the, the rough idea is that we start with some, we have a finite abstraction, but we, we uh, refine it uh, uh, for every trace differently. So we, we refine it on, on in every transition. In every transition the system makes, we refine the abstraction until some point that eventually we have to decide Okay, this is our abstraction for, for this trace. And now using this abstraction, we're going to show that there is no, uh, uh, no two states that have the same abstract, uh, abstract value. So we, we maintain both soundness and we improve the precision compared to, uh, compared to this approach. And another very important uh, char characteristic of this technique is that it really exploits our representation of, of the state of the system in first order logic. And really uh, our, uh, the abstraction that we use is just projecting a first order structure to a finite set of elements. So if we have a first order structure, we can project it to a finite set of elements. Say, if we want to project this structure just to two and three, just to these elements, it's just looking at this, uh, just keeping the information of the relations between these elements. And as long as we project to a finite set, we obtain a finite abstraction. So let's, let's go back now to, to our uh, fair queue example that we want to prove uh, the, that no element gets stuck in the queue. So we, we use this n star as our primitive relation. So this is how we encode the system. And then the, to express that the every element is infinitely often outside of the queue, this is what it looks like with n star. We say that uh, like th this is the negation, right? We say that there we want to show that there is no trace such that it infinitely often decues, and eventually we are globally in a state where C has a, suc a, su a successor. There is some element Y that is reachable from C and it's not equal to C. And we are going to prove that there is no infinite trace like this by showing that it does not contain a, a that it can that there cannot be an abstract lasso with a dynamic abstraction for this system. So now I want to give you a little bit more uh, uh, intuition into what is this uh, abstract la lasso that is like in the basis uh, of this approach. So it's, it's a finite uh, prefix of the trace that contains four special points. Well, the first is the initial one. The second one is what we call the freeze point. And in this example, the freeze point would be just the first point after we have reached the state where this element C entered the queue and it's going to stay there forever. And we know that this is going to happen because we have this eventuality here in the negation of the property. And during this point, we will refine the abstraction. We will collect all of the elements that participated in the trace that get the queued and then queued from, from, uh, from the queue. And we would refine the abstraction, but at this point we will freeze it. And from this point onwards, we're looking only in this abstraction, projecting to all the elements that participated in the, in the trace here. And we look for two elements, S1 and two states, sorry, S1 and S2, that have the same projection on, on this set D. So this is the, uh, the notion of, uh, of an abstract lasso, and it's all encoded and implemented in Ivy. And the way it's implemented is using this monitor that just keeps track of where are we in this uh, phase. So we start just watching for the fairness condition. So here we will just wait until this element gets in the queue and is never getting out of the queue. Then we freeze the abstraction. And then we non-deterministically guess where is this state that, that's going to repeat. And if we ever see the same state again, or uh, no, sorry, not the same state again, but the state that is project that has the same projection onto the set D that we fixed here, then we go to the error state. And using this uh, uh, using this gadget that we that, that's built into Ivy, we have reduced the problem of, of proving liveness 
to, a pr to the just a, a problem of proving safety over this augmented system. So now we have to give an inductive invariant that shows that the system comprising of, the, of this queue and this monitor will never reach its error state. And I want to give you a, a, a feel of what these kind of invariants look like. So these invariants, other than some basic properties of the, of the system, of the queue that, that, uh, that are needed, they have, the, they have two main uh, parts. One is to say that our finite set that we've frozen here, which is captured by this relation D, that it's large enough, that our abstraction is precise enough. So for this example, we are saying that while we're in the, in the watching phase, all of the elements in the queue, that are all of the elements that are reachable from the head, are in this D that collects the elements that we've uh, seen so far. Once we've frozen the abstraction, D no longer increases, but now all the elements that are reachable from C are in, in D. And once we've saved, once we've guessed the, this non-deterministic uh, point where we see the state that's going to repeat in the abstraction, then we say that all the elements that, are, that were reachable in this state, so n, n star s is the saved copy of n that we saved at this point. This represents this S1. We update it when we go from the frozen to the saved state of the monitor. We just copy all the relations to a shadow uh, copy of the vocabulary. One, and once we're in the saved state, all the states that were reachable, that were in the queue ahead of C, are in this domain, are, are in this uh, D. And the second important part of the, of the invariant is really what's preventing the monitor from going to the error state. It's pointing to some difference between the current state and the, and the state that we visited previously. And it says that if we have saved and we are no longer waiting for the DQ, remember we, we, are, we have to have a DQ between these two states, otherwise we could just be in the same state. So if, if we have saved and we are no longer waiting for the DQ, then there exists an X that was reachable from C, it was in the queue before, it was in the queue ahead of C, but now it's no longer reachable in the queue from C. And you see that this is going to be inside our abstraction because of this, and together this proves that the monitor will never go to its error state, and it proves liveness. And not only does it prove liveness, but it also results in verification conditions that are decidable to check, and then we get all of these properties that can that Ken mentioned that allow us to be more productive in verification. So now you can look at this uh, invariant that doesn't seem the simplest uh, thing, uh, maybe you've, you've, you, it doesn't seem as simple as, as the example, and you can think of this uh, original ranking function that we had. So first of all, you see that it is echoed in this invariant. Somehow the ranking function said that this set is decreasing, and here we're really using this set, the set of elements that are reachable from C, to pinpoint the difference between the current state and the previous state. We said that there is some element that was in this set, and now it's not in the set. So the core correctness argument is the same. It carries the same intuition, but it's encoded differently. And for this uh, very simple toy example that's used for the purposes of, of illustration, it's, it's perfectly, uh, I, I perfectly sympathize with the thought that this is much simpler and much nicer than this. But if you want to have mechanical proofs and, and you want to have the verification conditions mechanically checked and uh, you want to, to do it with the decidable logic, then this is really not the way to go. It's simpler for the human, but this is simpler for the machine to check. And, uh, and really, the, the, the way to, to evaluate this, this approach is not on toy examples like this, but on more complicated examples. And this is where this uh, thinking a bit more about how you encode the problem for the automation to be decidable, this is where it, uh, it really pays off. So we have uh, uh, done some, uh, some more complicated examples. Some of them, uh, this was the first uh, mechanized uh, uh, liveness proof. And really, it was the same, uh, the same structure of the monitor with the same watch frozen and saved. And it, it has really the same flavor of this example, but it's, m it's much more complicated protocols. 
And I really like this uh, stoppable Paxos example because it's, a, it's an optimization of Paxos that really makes the liveness very tricky. And it's the original paper of this protocol had a four-page manual proof of the liveness of, uh, of this protocol, all filled with, uh, with like a rigorous temporal reasoning. And this is how you would do it if you don't think about decidability and you do it just the way that it is most intuitive for, for a human. But with our encoding, we managed to replace this proof with, if you see, uh, 62, so it's, it's, it's 62 conjectures that you have to write in your invariant for it, but you get a lot of help from the automation and from the fact that you encoded the problem uh, such that the verification conditions are decidable. And I'll have Ken join me for, uh, okay. for the conclusion. I'll let you conclude. Okay, so what can we conclude? You remember when I was talking at the beginning about the hypotheses that we're working with here? We're saying we want to have productivity in the human effort in doing the verification, and to do that, we have to have in the automation this pro these properties of predictability, stability, and transparency. And in the case of a prover like Z3, the Im most important thing is going to be decidability. Okay, so we looked at some fragments of the logic where Z3 is decidable, and though on the surface it looks like those are really not powerful enough to do the kind of proofs we want to do about, for example, reachability and graphs and cardinality of sets and so forth, that in fact we have relatively straightforward strategies for reducing the, the verification conditions down to this decidable fragment, and IV provides us tools for doing this. For example, it allows us to, um, uh, for example, it allows us to uh, hide theories or properties that are inconvenient from the point of view of decidability behind some kind of abstract interface. And we saw several examples of that. Or in the case of liveness, it allowed, a, you know, Ivy has this built-in construction that's essentially reasoning, it's hiding this reasoning about the fact that some projection of the state space is finite. So we don't have to think about that. So what that means is that really, with the right tools, these decidable fragments are a lot more powerful than you might think, and they give us the ability to develop proofs in a much more productive way from the human point of view. And as we saw, even though we were looking at simple toy examples, the same techniques scale to more interesting examples with protocols like Cord and Paxos and Raft and so forth. So Ivy is an open source tool. You can check it out on the web. You can see what the real syntax of Ivy looks like and so forth. Um, there's a lot of things in Ivy that, of course, aren't covered here in our uh, tutorial. Uh, there's a paper that's in the proceedings that goes into a little more detail and has lots of references to papers about Ivy if you want to learn more. And if you have any idea of you know, applications, if you'd like to apply Ivy in any way, please contact us. We'd be very interested to hear about you know, new potential uh, problems, new potential applications. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Peter. Yeah. And we have time for some questions. Mm -hmm. S since you are defining an abstraction per uh, program, mm -hmm. and uh, also when you have a problem, you go more abstract when you define the soundness relation. You gave an example before. Mm -hmm. You will always be able to prove something. By the way. Ah, I, I, I have to, <laughs> excuse me. So yeah. you, you will always be able to prove something by going more abstract or in, in your level of abstraction that you do for, for your problem. But then you have the same problem as abstract interpretation that is uh, when your domain is not expressive enough, uh, mm -hmm. when, what do you do? Right. So and and I have a second question because mm -hmm. you can answer in any order. Mm -hmm. in, in principle, the separation logic mm -hmm. should be uh, included here because they have these basic predicates that are defined for once for all, and then mm -hmm. they have deduction rules that are defined once mm -hmm. for all. And I wonder if you can define it because they have this star operation. I am not sure you could. Uh, Oh, in other words, it. how difficult would it be able to would be, would it be to, for example, reason about heaps that contain inductively defined structures or, or something like that? But I was thinking of some data instead of having for each example handled by uh, some meta abstraction, but you mm -hmm. 
Mm, yeah, okay. So I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that first question. I think your first, your th wait, the second question, the first question had to do with, with expressiveness of yeah, the... Yeah, more on this one. Right. So, so the thing is, we're, not, we're taking away expressiveness here, but only for Z3. In other words, the, the human pr you know, is, is allowed to use any kind of reasoning in, in the logic. In this case, you know, we're restricted to first-order logic, but you could, you could go further than that. Uh, so the idea here is that we want, to we want to restrict the automation into its decidable fragment because we want it to have certain properties. But you know, some other things that I haven't talked about are, you know, Ivy actually has um, uh, a tactical theorem prover that's built into it. Right, so you can do, if you looked at the proof of, um, th this proof about set cardinality, one nice way to do it is actually to use that tactical theorem prover. So we're allowing the human user to do a lot more than we're allowing the automation to do. Uh, so of course, of course, you're still going to have incompleteness. Right? I mean, we have an expressivity problem because... In this case, not, not everything is expressible in, in first-order logic. Yeah, but, but in principle, we, you could go beyond first-order logic. Uh, you, could, you could even, for example, axiomatize ZFC if you wanted to. And, and there's, there's no reason you can't do that, but you can't do it with Z3. Right? I can't take some arbitrary proof obligation in ZFC and push it into Z3, because that's going to be very unreliable. So I'm really saying, what's the best way to get your proof obligations down to the point where we can reliably hit them with Z3? But that doesn't mean that you, know, you can't do any other kind of manual reasoning in order to, in order to do that. Um, so the second question. What about the Sebastian Berzinger non-dual Yeah, so, right, so, so separation logic, right. So it has this idea of it's sort of a second order quantifier. Right, where you're trying to say, when you have a separating conjunction, you're saying basically there exists a predicate that separates the heap such that blah. And uh, so, so, I mean, yes, we could do that, right? You could add that theory and you could, you could axiomatize these things. As I said, you could do set theory if you wanted to. But so the question of how hard, it would, how hard would it be to take those proofs that are based on separation logic and push the proof goals, you know, down to something decidable, you know, I can't, ans I can't answer that question without, you know, without actually trying that to see how it would work. Mm -hmm. So maybe can we just take another question and so then the So before that, I li I'd like to add a little mm -hmm. bit to the answer. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the really, for this decomposition, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a good answer. We could hope for a better theoretical answer to what what we, what we can prove and what we cannot say. We fix to FAU or to EPR and we use modularity. What example, can you, what example you, cannot, uh, you cannot do? This is, this is an interesting question. And for the liveness, we maybe have uh, some more answers for this because, the, the for example, the technique that we use for, uh, for, uh, for proving liveness, it actually, uh, if you analyze it, uh, what it can and cannot prove, it bounds you to some ordinal that you actually can't use more than that. So there are some, uh, some more things we can say uh, about w the, the choices of abstraction that we do, what proof power we are actually giving up for that. But for, I think for practical examples, it works, uh, it works very well. And you, you, can I you can create contrived examples where no matter how you, you apply this uh, liveness uh, proof, it won't prove it because it needs an ordinal that is too much. Peter? Um, I'm wondering about the, your point about productivity if it's related to the following. So mm -hmm. suppose you've got a program that you've proven. Mm -hmm. Now you change the program, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. There's two cases. Um, you might need to change the proof because it doesn't satisfy the specification anymore. Mm -hmm. But also sometimes it might satisfy the specification mathematically, but your um, encodings or whatever mm -hmm. didn't work out. Do you have any data or any experience on how that works out? Oh boy, so data on the, the question of sort of, you know, refactoring the program and how hard is it to reconstruct the proof. So I'm not sure I can give any data, but I mean, that's a really excellent question. Because if you look at this sort of spectrum of tools, you know, on, the, on one end you have sort of very powerful automated proof, which tends to be fragile. Right. Right? On the other end of the spectrum, you have very detailed manual proof 
which also tends to be fragile. So if you use, if you use Koch or some other theorem prover, you know, you know, if you make some small change in one of your definitions, it propagates all the way down through all your proof and you have a very large effort to reconstruct the proof. So I think the sweet spot in between those things is to have as much reliable automation as you can get. So you do as big steps in the proof as you can in an automated way, so you minimize the amount of proof that has to be reconstructed. So that's what I think. Now, do I have any data to support that? No. Th that's have you got it put into a CI system? I'm sorry, CI means? Con con um, continuous integration? Um, like oh, could you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this, you know, the question of as you keep modifying the program, you know, what does it take to to keep updating the proof? Can you keep Z3 running in the background and, and tell you when proof obligations are failing? Or uh? yeah, because the because when we when we actually deploy the stuff, I, I'm sure mm -hmm. you are, but when yeah. we actually deploy the code, code yeah. usually changes, and so we yeah. want to keep it verified. Yeah. So then we get get a CI system to. Redo the verification. Right. So, so, so you'd need to have right. So you'd need you'd want to have continuous integration, but but also you know the proofs are still going to be constantly breaking, right? So you're still going to have human effort all the time, you know, to go back and refactor those proofs to go along with the you know refactorings of the code or changes in features or, or specifications. I guess I guess my point is, mm. the less they break, the better. The less they break, the better, right? And it's, it's right. And you have two reasons that they break, point. right? So with the heavily manual proofs, of course, they're too detailed, and they break in the details. And with it, with the heavily automated proofs, they break because the proof automation is just fragile, and you have butterfly effect. Some, you know, I, I I commute some multiplication, and now it doesn't work or or whatever. So you know, so I think ideally where you want to be is in that middle ground where you have both reliable proof obligation, but as big steps as you can take. But again, that's a hypothesis. That's not, you know. In, in one previous talk, we had the use of Z3. They give the, the, ver the version the mm -hmm. because they say afterward it's no longer working uh, with right. the later version. Yeah. So how do you guarantee the stability of Z3 for your subset? Is it is this right. stable by definition? Well, by okay, so fortunately I work down the hall from, from, from you know, Leo and Nikolai, right? So, so if one of the things that they promised to work doesn't work, you know, I can go bother them and, and, and make sure that it does work. But they have a lovely paper on these fragments that describes the, uh, the MBQI technique, the model-based quantifier instantiation technique that they use to make sure they're, they're a decision procedure. So Z3 really is supposed to be a decision procedure for those things, and if it isn't, it's a bug. And needs to be and needs to be fixed. So you have a stable graph of Z3 forever. Well, I mean, you know, you never have stability of anything forever. But you know, on the other hand, if if I know that I'm in a decidable fragment, right? You know, then I know that I can develop a prover that will be able to handle it, whether any given tool is sufficiently stable or not to to do it. But I should say Z3 has been remarkably stable. You remember I, I said. You know, on all these proofs that we did, Z3 was just always coming back with answers, right? So it actually has lived up to the promise of those of those papers. And we have also checked multiple versions of Z3, and we've it, it, yes, it, through it, through yeah. versions of Z3, yeah. we keep updating. We didn't stop, you know, at a certain version, at a certain uh, GitHub commit, you know, of, of Z3. So. so you have these two arrows, and I think everybody buys the second arrow. What is mm. your evidence for the first arrow? What is the evidence for the first hour? Yeah, what, what is your... Right. So, so our empirical evidence is what I just said, which is that, in fact, as we do, we do, like, if you do this proof and you do 100 iterations of very slightly different VCs as you keep adjusting an inductive invariant or changing the proof in some way, Z3 is consistently giving back an answer. Right? No, I, I, I agree that you have evidence that you obtain PST, mm -hmm. but is it really uh, the decidability that is the cause. Well, no, I mean, it, there would be other ways, perhaps, of, of doing this, right? As long as you could guarantee that you had those properties, I'm not particular that it has to be. If you could find some way to solve undecidable problems reliably, right, I, that would be okay, right? No, but actually, it's different. It, mm -hmm. There may be decidable problems mm -hmm. that do not lead to PST. Well, okay, so I would say this. What we, the only thing that we have that's definite is we have a complexity bound, right? And the complexity bound is exponential, 
And so what that means is, you know, at some point as you make the problem bigger and bigger, Z3 is going to run out of steam. Right? It won't randomly because of a change in, 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 you know, some tiny change in the formula that doesn't change the semantics. It won't randomly fail because of that. But at some point things get large enough that just because of this worst case exponential complexity, you won't win. So the thing is, in that case, you at least have a strategy. I can say, if I can keep taking that, that problem and dividing it in size down by half and by half and by half by decomposition, right, I know I will eventually win. Right? I'll eventually get to the point where the problem is small enough that Z3 can handle it. If I'm in the undecidable fragment, I can have a three-line formula and put it in Z3, and it'll go forever. Right? And so where is, where is your limit to the complexity? So for example, mm -hmm. S to S is non-elementary? Mm. Oh, where is our, okay, so, right, exactly. So I would say, I would, okay, this is just an opinion. I would say stick with single exponential. Because you get a lot of power in single exponential, and it, you still you have this property that you know you divide the problem in size a few times, right? And you get down to the scale where it works. Not el not elementary, not so much, right? You know, so not non elementary is probably pretty hard to distinguish from undecidable. Right? So okay, just an opinion. But you see what I'm saying? You, you want to have a heuristic that will help you to decompose your proof. And one of those heuristics is, I need to make the proof obligations relatively small. I need to break my big proof up into small pieces. But if I don't have decidability, that heuristic doesn't work. I can get stuck with an arbitrarily small problem that doesn't work and I can't figure out why. Yes. Yes. So, so that so whether or not I'm in the fragment is decidable. Yes. Exactly. So, so I can give you reliable feedback if you have gone outside the fragment because of a non-stratification or some other reason. I can point to something where you have a problem, right? Reliably. Exactly. So that this is right. So this is the point that you want to get reliable, actionable feedback whenever something is going wrong. You don't just want to, you know, go off to infinity and say here's two gigabytes worth of instantiations, it didn't work, you figure it out. Um, so I wanted to ask if, uh, if there is a US usage manual for either IV or Z3, like uh, when to use a specific fragment of logic uh, which is decidable, or, right. or what kinds of formula might uh, be right. solved on Z3 and what might lead to like uh, infinite, uh, yeah. Right, so, so how do you give it, yeah, um, do you, do you want to? Uh, I mean, there is a user manual for Ivy. There isn't for Z3, right? Okay. And it has it has sort of lots of examples of the kinds of decompositions that I showed, and that's just you know going by example. Here's how you solve this problem. Here's how you sol solve this problem. And Ivy has sort of a growing library of abstractions, sort of like the one that you saw um, with the array problem and so on, that you can sort of you know plug in and, and reuse. And some of those have been reas reasonably. Uh, reasonably reusable. You know, how to know, like, for Z3, what's going to work well? well Z3 doesn't have a user manual. Uh, I mean, do you think you can, like, maybe create one? I mean, I think we are discussing some of this, these things right now, but maybe if it is documented, it might be easier for users to uh, work with it. It does seem that way, doesn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, I agree. Documentation would be, uh, yeah. So I've been try we've been trying to document Ivy. Right, it, to the extent of, you know, here's uh, not only what does it do, but here are all the tricks that you need to, to make it work. But of course, that's an ongoing, ongoing project. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I guess maybe we have time for one last question. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, maybe we can just, yeah, mm -hmm. thanks to the speaker again.